to our new video. So in today's video, we're going to learn, in this particular video, we're going to learn operating modes of 386. Before you take the plunge into 386 and start understanding everything about it, there is something before that you just need to know. That's called operating modes. On a lucky day, even this comes as a question. So I, I would say lucky because the other answers are so intense. This is such a light answer, but you still have to anyways know it. So 386 has three operating modes called real mode, protected mode and virtual 86 mode. I repeat, real mode, protected mode, virtual 86 mode. So why do you need them? The actual working of 386 is in protected mode. This is the main mode, okay? 99% of a lifetime that a 386 will spend will be in protected mode. If you've seen my previous video where I've given introduction to 386 and given its points, salient features and all, I had mentioned virtual memory management, segmentation, paging, protection, multitasking, 32-bit registers, 32-bit operations, etc. All this happens only in protected mode. Are you listening? Then your question is, then what is the point of real mode? We'll come to this later. What is the point of real mode? Real, in real mode, 386 doesn't behave like a 386 at all. It behaves like an 8086. It just works like a fast 8086. Why did I say fast? Because 8086 used to operate at 6 MHz. 386 operates from 16 to 33 MHz. So much higher frequency. But other than that, it is nothing else but an 8086. It works just like 8086. All registers are still 16 bits. All operations are still 16 bits. Address translation is still the same as segment into 10 plus offset. No protection, no virtual memory management, except for the basic address translation. No paging, no multitasking, nothing. It's just an 8086. Then you would say, then why is this stupid mode there? That is because protected mode cannot be entered directly. When you learn protection and the whole address translation process, which is just very soon, I'm just one by one making videos, I think by tonight they all will be up. So when you learn these address translation processes, you will know to do this, to work in protected mode, you need various system tables, thousands of them, okay, not one or two, thousands of system tables. They are called global descriptor table, which is one. LDT, local descriptor table, which is as many as there are tasks in the system, which in simple language means as many programs as you have or as many apps as you have in your phone. Just giving you a simple correlation, okay? Don't take it one to one person, exactly. Anyway, so you need lots of LDTs, you need a GDT, you need an IDT interrupt descriptor table, you need a TSS, task date segment, you need page tables. There are thousands of, uh, there are one million pages, whose information are stored in 1000 page tables, whose information is stored in a page directory. You won't understand these things right now. When you do learn the translation, you'll understand. What I'm trying to say is, you need a whole environment with thousands of tables in the system to make protection mechanism work. On reset, when you reset 386, how can all these tables be pre-present inside the RAM? Come on, we are not idiots. On reset, the RAM is empty. So all these tables have to be created. They would be there in the hard disk, which have to be loaded into the RAM and the whole environment has to be set up for entering protected mode. Now to do that, to get all these tables into the RAM, to create these tables, you need a program. Am I right or no? Where is that program? That program, to execute that program, to run that program, the processor has to be active. Programs are executed by the processor. That means it is impossible for 386 to start in protected mode because to work in protected mode, it has to first run some programs to create the environment for protected mode. So only for that reason, to just create the required environment for protected mode, 386 starts in real mode. Do you understand? Not just 386, every processor starts in real mode. So you'll be surprised, even your home PC, the processor that you're using at home, on reset, it works like an 8086. What a surprise. Now you feel proud that you learned 8086. Even modern computers, when they switch on, only when they switch on, they work like 8086 so that they can set up their environment. Of course, at a very high frequency, but modern processors work at gigahertz. Anyway, once the environment is set up, there is a bit called PE. There are control registers in which CR0, control register 0, has a bit called PE, stands for protection enabled. I'll be teaching you the control registers very soon. So there's a bit called PE. That bit is 0 by default. Once this whole environment has been set up, the program will make PE1. As PE becomes 1, a new avatar of 386 comes into picture. 
now it works in protected mode now 8086 working is gone everything will now work differently in the new form of 386 all these features will now come into picture because the necessary tables have been created anyway so now you work in protected mode from now till the time you switch off your computer it will be in protected mode are you listening so as i said 99% of its lifetime it spends in protected mode once you're in protected mode you cannot switch back to real mode are you listening you made pe1 you enter protected mode so people say okay it make pe0 try making pe0 it won't even accept it the pe will remain one you can now not go back to real mode are you clear now what if you want to run an 8086 based program if you want to still do an 8086 based application and work like an 8086 You cannot go back to real mode, but you can go into a virtual 8086 mode. Did you understand this? There is something called as virtual 8086 mode. In protected mode, there is there is an extension of flag register in which there is a flag called VM, virtual mode, virtual 86 mode. So by making that flag one, that flag is zero by default. Everything is zero by default. So by making that flag one, you go to virtual 86 mode, run your 8086 program, do what you want to, make the flag zero, go back to which mode? protected mode again make it one if you want to again make it zero no problem you stay in protected mode all the time it's not like you keep doing this 10 times a day once a while you want to do an 8086 function a program written for 8086 no problem work in virtual 86 mode you cannot go back to real mode please tell me other modes clear so let's say it again we switch on in which mode real mode why to set up the environment for protected mode you need programs to do that things don't happen by magic and for a program to execute the processor has to be on so it starts in real mode Builds the whole environment, makes PE bit is equal to one, enters protected mode. Now it will spend all its life in protected mode till the time you don't switch it off. You cannot go back to real mode. Now, if you want to work and work on an 8086 based application, you can go to virtual 86 mode, do the operation, come back to real mode. Please tell me, did you understand this? From real mode, you can never go to virtual 86 mode. And don't even ask me why, because why would you want to? That's the first question. You are in real mode. You're working like an 8086. You don't need to work a virtual 86 mode. You are working as an 8086 only. Are you clear? So from real mode, you go to protected mode. From protected mode, you can go to V86 mode. Come back to protected mode. You cannot go back to real mode. Those were the modes. Now, in Bombay University especially, do you get this question? I don't know why. In spite of there being such good topics in 386 to us, they ask the most silly question. Compare real mode and protected mode. It happens sometimes. They just want to set an easy paper and makes uh, you know make life easy for the student. I'm not complaining. I'm just wondering. There are so many good topics. What you want to make life easy for a student, or you want to make a student a good engineer? That's the choice. Anyway, that's the examiner's choice. I'm here to teach you the subject. So sometimes they ask you this question: Compare real mode and protected mode. It's like comparing 8086 and 8386. Okay, because in real mode it works like an 8086. In protected mode it works like a 386. Now I've written. About eight, nine, ten points. You can write another ten by yourself. It's like it's two whole processors that you're comparing. In real mode, it works like an 8086. So it'll do 16-bit operations. 32-bit operations are not allowed. In protected mode, it'll do 32-bit operations. Real mode is the default mode after reset. Protected protected mode has to be entered by making PE bit one. It's not the default mode. Real mode, there are 16-bit general purpose registers. Remember AX, BX, CX, BX. They were 16-bit registers. In protected mode, those registers expand into 32-bit registers. They are called EAX, EBX. E stands for extended, obviously. So, the, in real mode, the registers are 16 bits. In protected mode, the registers are 32 bits. Only 8086 flags are available in real mode. When you see the flag register of uh, 386, you will notice some new flags are added. But those new flags are not available in protected mode. Uh, in real mode, they are only available in protected mode. The actual working of 386. So only 8086 flags are available. Here, those flags are of course available. Plus new flags are added by 386. Virtual mode, RF, NT, IOPL. There are four new flags. Immediately after this, the next video is that. So I'll be covering that anyway. Physical address calculation is the same we did in the age-old method. Segment address multiplied by 10 plus offset. Segment address multiplied by 10 plus offset. This is how you calculate physical address in real mode. In protected mode, <laughs> this is a big process. It take, will take two full videos of at least 45 minutes to an hour to understand how to calculate physical address. Okay, so first it does segment translation, then it does page translation, then it finally gives you the physical address of the location that you want to access. Anyway, so that is the difference between address translation. 
16 bit offset addresses remember 886 had sp bp si di what are they offset registers how many bits were they 16 bits now offset addresses are 32 bits now since you had 16 bit offset address you could access a segment could be of size size 2 raised to 16 2 raised to 16 is 64 KB. Now, since you have 32 bit offset addresses, segments are much bigger. 2 raised to 32, that is 4 GB. 4 GB is the size of your RAM. 4 GB can be the size of one segment. Segments are not stored in your RAM. Segments are stored in your virtual memory, which is basically implemented using hard disk. So, in your hard disk, there are seg segment means files. So, potentially every file of 386 could be as big as 4 GB. Whereas every segment of 8086 could be only up to 64 KB. See the big jump in size. Anyway. No paging, no protection, no multitasking. They are all different points, didn't have space and I want to cover all the videos as soon as I can. So I'll just put it together but write them as separate points. No paging, no protection, no segment translation, no uh, multitasking. Yes, yes, yes for all of them. And no control registers. So there are four new registers that I'm going to be teaching you very soon. They are called control registers. They are not available in real mode. Only the first register, CR0, only one bit of that is available. That is the PE bit to make to enter protected mode. Nothing else is available. Whereas in protected mode, all the four control registers, I'm going to teach you that. They are available. Okay. So these are 10 points. As I said, you can add more points by yourself. The purpose of real mode, the purpose of protected mode, the advantage of protected mode. Anyways, I'll give you 10 points. It's a five mark question. So you have ample points anyway. Okay, now we go into our next video. See ya.